This gallery is in itself a work of art. I'm surprised at how many people have a car. They won't let their wives drive it. I sort of realize there aren't any people of color in those apartments. Women in Australia retire with 35% less super than men. And we're sick of it. The system was never built for us, so Verve Super was. Verve was founded by women to support women to build wealth and invest in a better world, while we all work together for change. Because super is power, and women deserve more of both. Verve, proud partner of All About Women 2021. Where me? Well, I'm a Bemai. Juba Gali. Nora Gadigul Mujin. Gurgawiri Gagala Gui. Yaguna Bariala Benga Bujari Gunyalu Yalum. The Sydney Opera House acknowledges the lands of the Gadigal. And we welcome you to Juba Gali, now known as Benalong Point. The Sydney Opera House honours our First Nations by fostering a shared sense of belonging for all Australians. And we pay our deep respects to the Gadigal people, traditional custodians of Jubagali. Welcome to the Sydney Opera House and enjoy the show. Good evening, thank you. That's very kind. Um, it's great to have you here, what a treat. I'm just going to, I know many of you have been through this before, I'm just gonna do it really quickly because it, we do want to hear your comments just before we go and meet tonight's, uh, today's special guest. Slido, are you all familiar with this? It's, um, it's the, the way we'll be collecting the questions and answers um, for the later section of the talk. If you are seated in the venue today or joining us at home, so this applies universally, what you need to do is open your preferred browser, go to slido, sli.do, type in the event code All About Women, select the venue, uh, which is the Joan Sutherland Theatre right now, to be directed to the question submission page. I have a very, I'm extremely technically on top of things. I have a Duvalaki here. <laughs> I will be looking on the Duvalaki um, for any questions you wish to ask. My idea is, um, is that we'll leave time at the end, but in fact, if there are questions that come in during the conversation, we might go to them too. Uh, now, our guest this afternoon at this beautiful venue has really lived the fullest imaginable life. She's a journalist, an activist, author, lecturer, traveler. Her latest work, the Soul of a Woman, very beautiful book, gives us so much to talk about that I've decided let us not squander time on a lengthy introduction. Just let's say and give a very warm welcome to the fabulous Isabel Allende. Thank you, <laughs> thank you. What a treat, great to have you here Isabel. Um, 
let's go right into it, because this is a wonderful book. It's, it's, um, we'll come to your soul, but let's talk about the woman. Um, and you write quite early on that you have been in rebellion against male authority since you were a child. How were you so wise so young? I wasn't wise, I was just very angry. Uh, and I think it all started with my mom. My mother was a senorita in a, in a very conservative, authoritarian, Catholic, patriarchal family and society in Chile in the 40s. And she married against her parents' wishes um, to the wrong man, my father. He was married for four years and had three kids. There was no pill available then. And uh, my father abandoned her before my youngest brother was born. So she had to return to her father's house. So I grew up in my grandfather's home. And it was a male house with my bachelor uncles, my grandfather. My, unfortunately, my grandmother died very young. And uh, I grew up seeing my mother as a charity case. Uh, my grandfather paid for school and for clothes and I assumed the doctor's bills, but my mother never had any pocket money. She didn't have any freedom because at the time there was no divorce in Chile. Chile was the last country in the world to have divorce in 2004. And the only, so she was separated from her husband and therefore everybody was watching her. She was also very pretty. And so her reputation was always at stake. And I grew up with the idea that my mom was having a horrible life. The only way that she could get any attention was by being sick. So she was sick all the time. Yeah. I didn't want to be like her. I wanted to be like my grandfather. Did you ever see your father again? No, I only saw him once many years later in the morgue. He died of a heart attack in the street. And they uh, called me to my office. I was then a journalist and people more or less knew who I was. So they called me to identify the body of this man that had my last name. But I couldn't identify him because I had never seen a picture. And then my, my stepfather came and he said, take a look at him, that's your father. I didn't feel anything. I had never seen, seen him. I had never had any relationship with him. Tell me a bit about the relationship with your mother because when one sees one's mother um, weak and suffering and needing to be supported, as you said, by the grandfather, sometimes a child will pay out on the mother too. Did you, were you like that or did you understand her predicament? I don't, I don't know if I understood, but I wanted to protect her, to save her. That was my mission in life. And I also learned very early that I had to support myself if I wanted to help my mother. Uh, my grandfather, who was a wonderful man, by the way, I don't want you to think that he was horrible. He was a patriarch, uh, in the, uh, an old-fashioned patriarch, but he was a very good guy. And he would say, he who pays the bills gives the orders. So I realized very early that I had to pay my bills if I wanted to not to be ordered around. I don't think And that's what I did very early. Start working. I don't think you needed to be a grandfather living in Peru to believe that. I think we've all heard a version of that. <laughs> he yeah. who pays gets the right. Um, but let's be honest, Isabel, that it, it wasn't just that very difficult home situation because, in fact, you were expelled from school by the nuns yeah, well, when you were six. So you were not an easy child. <laughs> I, I must have been rebellious, but I think that everybody said that, it, that I had been expelled because I was so rebellious and so stubborn. But the truth is that I think she, I was expelled because of my mother's situation. She was a single mother with three kids. And, uh, and I think the nuns didn't like that that much. What about, apart from, I mean, the financial implications of that, I mean, it was a very judgmental time, wasn't it? And she was a mm, woman alone. Yes. Did, 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 did society pay out on her too? Of course, of course. Plus, she fell in love with a man who was married and had four kids. Imagine, as I said, there was no divorce. The only way that you could uh, d dissolve a marriage was annulment. And that was some legal trick that you could do if both parts agreed. 
My father immediately agreed to the annulment with the condition that he would not have to support the kids. And he carried that to the extent that he never saw them again. But my stepfather, he could never annul his marriage. So he waited all his life for his wife, first wife to die so that he could marry my mother. But the wife lived to be 92. <laughs> in, spite of all the, in spite of all the praying that we did that she would die before she didn't. <laughs> so, That's not uh, very by kind. The time the, well, well, by the time the lady died, we had divorced in Chile, finally. But who's going to divorce an old lady of 92? I mean, yes. you really would have to be really poor. Cool. <laughs> so uh, my, my stepfather waited. And then at some point she died. And by then my parents, my, my stepfather and my mother were ancient to, to the point that they couldn't even climb the stairs to get to the, to the courts to be married. So they had to send the judge to the house. And the judge thought that they were demented. And why would, why would they marry? I mean, that, that was really something. But in any case, and I told my mom, I said, mom, why do you want, do you want to marry? Wouldn't it be better to be just legendary lovers? <laughs> no, she didn't like that. He, she really wanted to have a white dress. I mean, dress like a bride. I have a picture of my mother dressed as a bride at 80 something. Really? And she looks fabulous. That's such a wonderful story. And do you remember how you felt the day your mother married? Were you excited? Were, did you just think, oh, what on earth is going on? Yeah, exactly. But. That's what I said. <laughs> what is this going on? <laughs> Why? <laughs> you know what? And then I married at 76. So. <laughs> We're going to know. come to your marriages, Isabel. You had a number of them. But I want to talk just again. <laughs> wait, wait a minute. Not a number of them, just three. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I mean, you made me sound as if I was Elizabeth Taylor or something. <laughs> I do forgive you, forgive, beg your pardon. Um, we, we've talked a bit about you know, the conservatism of, of the, the world in, 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 that you grew up in. Now, only because, and I promise I won't start, but I've been trying to learn uh, studying Spanish for hace mucho. And the thing that struck me as a feminist when I started was the number of words that are specifically related to masculino, there's el hombre, el varón, el macho. El macho. <laughs> so many words. And that, one imagines, is a reflection of the way the society is. It, tell us a bit about that macho nature of generally South Excuse American... Excuse me, Jennifer, you live in Australia, and that's a very macho place too. <laughs> so I don't have anything to teach you. Well said. The oca doesn't have quite the same sound as el varón. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so, I mean, t tell us a bit of what it was like being in that, in that very masculine culture growing up. I mean, we, you're right, we have our own traumas. Well, I, I, I assume it's, it, it has a lot to do with the, with the time. In, in, I mean, it was 40s, 50s, early 60s, but, but also the social class. Um, in the upper classes in Chile, women didn't work. Uh, middle class and lower classes, they had to work. So therefore, they were much more independent in many ways. Uh, they, and public education in Chile was excellent, was better than private education. So probably most of the professional women that you had at the time came from the middle class and the lower middle class educated in public schools. Um, but I wasn't so fortunate. I, was, I didn't go to college. I hardly finished high school. And, um, and then I started working different things until I worked as a journalist, just because I started doing it, not because I studied. And why did you choose? It was a very male, male place, of course, and it still is. Why did you choose journalism, Isabel? I didn't. Look, I have had very few choices in my life. Most things have just happened to me. I was one day sitting in my house, super pregnant. I was ready to give birth to my second child. And this woman showed up and she was called Delia Vergara. And she was a young, beautiful woman who wanted, who was going to um, start a feminine magazine with a feminist 
slammed. And um, she had read some letters that I had sent to my mother in Geneva. And she thought that I could write. And so she came and said, would you like to work in the, in the magazine? Ha! Huh, that was fantastic for me. I, the only thing I wanted was to get out of the house as soon as the baby was born. I just hate domestic chores. And I don't like children that much either. <laughs> so uh, I really needed to get out. <laughs> and I started with the magazine in 1967. And I became a journalist by doing it, not because I studied. So this woman approached you, but you're saying you never actually thought that you would ever have a job? Is that right? No, no, no. I always had jobs. I worked all my life. I, I finished high school at 16, almost 17, and I started working immediately. So I always had a job. What sort of jobs did uh, you do? But, but I, all kinds of stuff. I worked in FAO, in the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. I started serving coffee. I ended up counting forests and trees. It was very boring. <laughs> I did all kinds of jobs. And then eventually I had this job at the magazine and that saved my life for sure. Because there I, uh, I learned about feminism. I realized I wasn't a lunatic. There was a movement out there called the Women's Live movement, and millions of women were not only working to, to, for women's rights, but, but also they were writing wonderful stuff that I could read. Uh, that changed my life. It gave me an articulate language to transform the anger into action. Because you said you, you were very angry. Did you... Did you channel that anger into your work? As a feminist in the magazine, yes, but I always did it um, with more and, and in a soft way. You know, men have been very successful in depicting feminists as these hairy bitches that don't shave their armpits and they are smelly. Uh, that is a male thing, that's not true. And uh, I, I think quite the opposite, that being a feminist can be very sexy and very feminine. Mm. So uh, that's what I try to, to do with my articles in the, in the magazine. And it worked pretty well. And you went on, um, I think it was your first book was 1982, is that right? That you wrote House of the Spirit? Yeah, Spirits? but that was later. I, by then I was living in exile because the magazine lasted only six years. I mean, it continued with the same name, but it wasn't the same magazine after the military coup. In 1973, um, we had a military coup that ended a long democratic tradition in Chile. And of course, there's nothing more male chauvinistic than the military. Mm. And so the, the, the magazine was transformed into a glossy uh, fashion magazine that really nobody read. And uh, I had to get out of my country. And I ended up in Venezuela, where I couldn't find a job as a journalist. Again, I did all sorts of odd jobs. I ended up administering a school. Not the right job for me. As I said, I don't like children. <laughs> Plus, I can't add. So I, I was in charge of, of banks and, and money. And, <laughs> Frankly, I don't know how we didn't go bankrupt. <laughs> and then, while working in the magazine, I worked two shifts from 7 o'clock in the morning to 7 o'clock in the evening. I would get home, and in 1981, I started a letter for my grandfather that became the House of the Spirits. I could only write at night in, on the kitchen counter. And after a year, I had 560 pages of something that didn't look like a letter anymore. What, that was the house of the spirits. Isabel, what gave you the confidence to try that? I mean, I know you completed no it, but confidence. even to start. Despair. No, it was just despair. I, my, my life was going nowhere. My m marriage was collapsing. My children were going to university and they didn't even like me. Uh, it, I didn't know what to do with myself. And then we got a call from Chile that my grandfather was dying. So I started a letter for him, and the letter immediately, I mean, on the second page, I already knew it wasn't a normal letter. It, there was, it, was, it was something else. It was part memory, part 
family story, art, imagination, all the anecdotes that my grandfather had told me about the family were there. So I don't know, I didn't know what I was doing and I didn't care. I, I didn't think that anybody was going to read it. I had no expectations of any kind. And as you know, we've been taking some questions from the audience as we go through, and this is, would have been absolutely my next question. I think it's exactly how has then your understanding of feminism, which started almost as a reaction to your father running off, and, um, and you then may, professionally, how has it changed over your career? Have, has the movement changed um, for you or you've changed with it? I have changed with the movement. There have been an evolution in the movement. We have met crossroads and we have had to change directions. There has been backlash. Some, sometimes the movement has stalled. And I've been really discouraged to see that young women don't want to call themselves feminists because it's not sexy or something. Um, but I have always been very clear that this is a very long haul and this is, and the final goal is to defeat the patriarchy. It's not a war against men because I think that men, our children and grandchildren are our allies. They shouldn't be our enemies at all. It is the system that needs to change. And what is patriarchy? Patriarchy is a system that gives dominance and supremacy to the male gender over women, nature, other species, and many other men as well. Because men who don't fit the profile are also victims of the patriarchy, and the poor, of course. So it, it, this system, which doesn't make anybody happy, what's Do that noise? That's people applauding you, Isabel. That's an agreement. Oh, oh I thought my... my I, That's I, I agreement. My, my computer wasn't working. No, okay, um, Well, and, and what, is, what is feminist? Now they're making a lot of noise. And I think okay. the reaction... And so what is feminism, Jennifer? Feminism is an uprising against the system. It's not a war against men, especially not young men. They're all guys who have to wait until they die off, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I understand, and it's... it's I'm not disrespecting that thought that it's it's that we have to bring men with us and, and, and it is an oppression of many men also. But the truth is it's very hard, I think, particularly there are things happening in Australia now at the moment that you that we won't take you through, but it's very hard not to feel oppositional. It's very hard to feel that one should actually, having worked one's way into a position of some some authority, some independence as a feminist, that we should be reaching back and helping men come through because they seem very slow to change. Kick them in the ass. Hmm? You have to kick them in the ass. What are you going to do? <laughs> uh, I mean, they have to change sooner or later. But, but you know, women, we, we struggle, but we don't have enough power. We don't have a critical number of women in power to change the world, and that's what we need. And we can do it because now we can, we are interconnected in, in ways that we were not before, informed, educated. We have more means than we had before. So things happen much faster. And, and now with this new way of, of young people, and I say people because I see young men in the streets protesting with the women, uh, everything can change even faster. Mm. I, I don't think I will see in my lifetime the end of the patriarchy, but I think that my granddaughters will be able to live in a world in which the patriarchy will have been replaced by a management of the world in which men and women in equal numbers will have equal power and in which feminine and masculine values will have the same weight in the society. Then we will live in a, in a world that is sustainable, more compassionate, inclusive, where decency and truth and peace prevail. Now we live in a world of violence and competition and greed. And, and I've got to ask... Does it make, make anybody happy? 
But we're coming from a situation um, where the supposedly most powerful, the Slido is not working, just so you know, the most powerful man in the world nominally until recently, President Donald Trump. This was a man who stood up and he would boast about grabbing women by the pussy. He had the classic trophy wife. He was abusive, contemptuous, um, spoke exactly, exactly. disgustingly. And that is the truth. How do we get beyond this? That was, that's what democracy rendered unto us. Now we have a different man, but, but it doesn't seem that we are making the progress that you talk of. Reassure us. We are getting there. We are getting there. I am absolutely sure that we evolved. We are not going back. And people like Trump will disappear, will disappear sooner or later. Thank God he's 70 something. <laughs> uh, Isabel, oh, so are I you. And look at you. <laughs> well, I have a better soul than him. You do indeed. Yeah. I do. You do indeed. I, you know, I just think of Trump naked and I feel like vomiting. No, I think a wave of revulsion has swept through. <laughs> My God. But what, I, what is interesting to me about you, and I said, I'm sorry, I, I can't take your call, or questions at the moment because this device is not working, but um, I, when it does, I shall. Um, what, what strikes me in this book, you write not just about the feminism that you almost kind of feminized yourself, that you founded for yourself, that worked for you personally. But you also say, you know, issues such as gender fluidity. Uh, you're very comfortable with that. You have non-binary grandchildren. Was that a big jump for someone from your background? Or it, it's too no. logical? No, no, it wasn't a big jump. At the beginning, what was the big jump was the, the pronouns because English is my second language. And I had to ask my grandchildren's friends, what's your favorite pronoun? And many times the pronoun is in plural and you have to conjugate the verb in singular. For someone who, who speaks Spanish, that's almost impossible. <laughs> so that made it a little difficult. But, but I, understand the, I understand from where it comes it comes from, from, from trying to eliminate this toxic masculinity in which we live. And young people are into that. It's, it's fine with me, absolutely. I want to pursue this issue of pronouns. It's one of the very intriguing things in your book, um, and it's not related to contemporary feminism at all, it's just a fascinating fact, that you said, in fact, the whole question of pronouns was um, politicised after the breakup of Yugoslavia, as it, you know, the, it collapsed into different republics. And you said it was the use of pronouns was an incredibly important political element then. Could you share that? Well, actually, it seems that that's not completely accurate. Uh, I got that information from the Global Fund from, for Women in a visit that they did in 2006 to the former Yugoslavia. And feminist groups there told them that they had been changing the, the pronouns after this uh, horrible war in which ultranationalism and ultra populism and ultra machismo had happened. And they were trying to distance themselves from that. But um, I just got a letter from my editor in Yugoslavia, Yugoslavia, who says that probably didn't start there. Who knows? It doesn't matter where it started. Oh, well. The thing is that it went global very fast. Well, we just ignore those few pages because it is quite interesting, I mean, this idea that it's got a political background. Yeah, it is very interesting. But not quite true. Okay. Um, to... Well, I don't know. Maybe it is true. <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> There's a question which, because the, the um, uh, Stato is working again, um, someone has asked a question... How much of you there is there in Irene of um, Love and Shadows? Is this book uh, inspired her to study journalism? She loves the story. How much of you is in that story? You said it was about your grandfather. Yeah, that, that, no, that story is... I, I wrote that story in exile in Venezuela. At the time, I, was, I, I had written The House of the Spirits and my agent said, anybody can write a good first book. The writer is proven on the second book and the ones that follow. So I started immediately a second book. And that was of Love and Shadows. And it's based on a political crime that happened in Chile. 
In Chile in 1978, uh, they discovered a mass uh, grave inside an abandoned mine where they found 15 bodies of peasants that had been executed, killed by the, by the military in 1973. And among them were five members of the same family, the father and four men, four boys. And um, I researched this in Venezuela as much as I could because in sen it was censored. The whole press was censored in Chile. I couldn't get much information except the information that was published abroad. And I wrote that story. Uh, and I uh, introduced the characters of Irene and Francisco, who were a young couple based on people I had known in Chile. It, it's not me. It's not you. Book. It's not you. No. Were you astonished? When uh, there's, there's, some, there's always some of me because I use my own experience to, to how do I say, to create part of the, of, the, of the story that I'm telling. If I didn't have the experience, it would be hard for me to write about it. But everything is fiction. Mm. Even my own life is fiction. <laughs> Were you astonished? Yeah, at, at I'm, a, I'm a great liar. <laughs> But how do we know which bit? <laughs> I don't know. Neither do I. <laughs> Were you I mean, obviously your life changed dramatically after the success of that book. Were you surprised or you always felt that your moment would come as an author? No, no. Everybody was surprised. It took everybody by surprise, especially me. And I wasn't aware of the success of the book until a year later because the book was published in Europe, in, in Spain, in uh, 1982, in September. And in October, my agent took the book to the, book, uh, to the Frankfurt Book Fair. Mm. Every European language bought the book. But I wasn't aware of that until a year later, because I was very far away and I lived a very private life. So, so success didn't happen suddenly for me. It built up. And everything was like bonus. Everything was a surprise. Everything was just a miracle that had happened. It took me many books to, to have the self-confidence and say, I'm a writer. If I had to fill a form, I would say journalist. I wouldn't say writer. And it also took me many years to, to know that, that the, the stories come to me, it's true, but I make them happen. It's not as if they are dictated from the beyond. No, they, I work on them. But I didn't know that for, me, for a long time. Yes. I thought it was just a fluke that it would never happen again. A question we've got here from um, someone in the audience, which is what advice would you give to a young woman, not a confident, maybe young woman, seeking to become a writer? What would you tell them? <laughs> the first... The, the best advice, I heard it from Elizabeth Gilbert. Someone from the audience asked her, and she said, don't expect your writing to give you money or fame. Write because you love the process. And I would add, don't even expect to be published. Write because you love the process. But if you are going to write, I would say this thing is like training for sports. You write every day. You train and train and train. A thousand drafts. Nobody cares how many drafts. Nobody cares about the effort. The only thing that matters to, to the sports person is the performance at the game. And for you, it's a final product. So don't complain. Don't whine. Don't show your work to everybody. Just, Just work. Right. Okay. Quietly. Quietly. <laughs> I would like to return to the political arena for a minute. I mean, your, uh, effectively your, your uncle, um, your godfather was Salvador Allende, the great leader of Chile who was, who, who was killed. Um, and I, I, I wonder if uh, what in this feminist struggle, and it is still a struggle even after all these decades, what is the role, potentially, of political leadership? I mean, Salvador Allende changed his country and died for it. Um, what 
should we, we saw Trump, what can we expect of our political leaders to stand up and actually support the fight for feminism rather than um, continue with patriarchy? Well, w oh, that we can force it. We women vote. So we can force it. Also, we have to get involved in politics in, 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 in a critical number because where do we exert power? Where do we change the laws? Where do we change everything? In politics. I had a conversation online uh, for an event with uh, Alicia Garza. Alicia Garza is one of the co-founders of Black Lives Matter. She's this fantastic woman. She's a force of nature, only 40 years old, so I can only imagine what she will do in the next 40 years. And she wrote a book called The Purpose of Power. And the whole point of, her, of the book and her life is that uh, you can fight for all the things that the black community needs, but if you don't get involved in politics and you are not in Congress and you don't become the president, you will not change anything. And that is what women have to do. I mean, if we want a, a, a world in which feminine values have the same weight as masculine, we have to get involved in politics. But are you familiar and with that? Is are you familiar with the phenomenon where people, uh, where women who are elected to politics, then abandon their principles and speak with you know harshly, wrongly, and do not support women once they get there? I think because I know there's not a about. critical number. Look, when I I remember when when I was young, and um, the pill was invented and came to Chile, and finally women could have some control of their fertility. They went out to work outside the home. At the beginning, we would wear suits and many of us ties and a briefcase, and we acted like men, talked like men, and tried to look like men to be respected and, and to be visible. Then there was a critical number of women in the workforce, and, and that's not necessary anymore. No one is wearing a tie. The same with politics. If you, if you can name by name the women in the world that are prime ministers or that are presidents, it's because there are very few of them. And often they have to act like men to get there and to be and to stay there. But the more of us that will be there, if the, the, the nature of power changes instead of having the nature of women change when they are in power. Do you think that the movement that is feminism is actually, are we winning? Are we making, are we making, pro, we are making progress, but are we prevailing? It's sometimes you do feel a little despairing. I, do, I think we are making progress. We are not prevailing yet, but it, we're getting there. And things have ch are changing. I mean, the, the, the whole thing about gender and... A, <laughs> you remember Anita Hill 20-something yes. years ago? Yes. Yeah. Anita, Anita Hill was the first time a woman stood in front of, the, of power, spoke truth to power, and said, this is what happened to me. And before her, we were all harassed and we thought it was natural. It was, that happened, so what are we going to do about it? She put the, the, the issue on the table. She, she lost then the battle, but won the war. And after her, harassment became an issue all over the world. There are laws about it now. And no man, I mean, if a man dares harass a woman, he will pay the consequences. Before, there were no consequences. Not everywhere. So we are getting, well, not everywhere. Not everywhere. And not everywhere. And we are, women are still victim, victims of all kinds of violence. First, domestic violence that, you know, when, when we think of violence, we think of war and we think of men at war. The first victims, of war are women and children, civilians. The worst kind of violence, the most general violence is against women, domestic violence. And because they have added the word domestic, it's no longer real violence. It's just a cultural issue, something that happens inside, inside mm. the home. Yeah. I've, 
I've got a and, number. And in very few countries, that is penalised as it should be. And that's actually one of the, there's a number, of the, a number of the questions here actually do ask specifically about Chile and whether, in fact, things have changed in terms of the circumstance for women in Chile, to your knowledge. Well, Chile is one of the countries that has the highest domestic violence in the world. But I think it's because we keep records more than in other places. Because uh, domestic violence and violence against women is, women is everywhere. In Chile, the women's movements are very, very strong and well organized. And they have been protesting in the streets and now we are going to have a new constitution. Uh, we are drafting a constitution, the people, it's, it's going to be a democratic constitution to replace the one that was uh, imposed by the dictatorship in 1981. Mm -hmm. uh, and women are participating in full numbers in this. And the idea is to have uh, gender parity in Chile. So at least for, uh, legally, that will happen if the constitution is approved as we think it will. Do you feel that... Um that you have a personal contribution to make? Do you get involved in a number of groups yourself? I have a foundation that supports groups and we support them financially. And of course, sometimes I have to make a statement or something, but I don't work in the field. I, I don't, no, I'm, <laughs> I live in this attic where you see me. This is my, my little den and I live here writing. And that's all I do. Well, I cook for my husband sometimes also. <laughs> Though I, there's a lovely comment in, in your book where you talk about um, now being in your later 70s, that you, uh, you wouldn't want to commit the same epic idiocies that you did um, between your 30s and 50s. But is that strictly true? Is that strictly true you wouldn't want to? Isn't actually the idiocies between men and women in good relationships part of the joy of life? Well, or, when or they men, are men in and good women relation, and women. Yes. Well, when, when, when the two partners are in good relationship, it's not idiotic. Uh, it, it becomes idiotic when you do stuff that hurts you and you know it's hurting you and you keep doing it. That's when the hormones are raging. Uh, I, I used to fall in lust, not anymore. Now I fall in love, which is way better. You, you, in fact, were single again um, in, I think, up to 28 years of marriage. You, you, that was the end of your first marriage. You married again. You're now on your third marriage. Is it better third time around? <laughs> yeah, and probably fourth time will be even better. <laughs> Are you joking? <laughs> no, look, all my, my, my love affairs have lasted 20 years. In the first case, I, 20 years, I loved my first husband. And then the nine more years that I stayed with him, I was trying to fix the marriage and I, didn't, I couldn't. So we ended up separating. Then I married Willie. Well, I loved him for 20 years and the last eight years, I shouldn't have been there. So I know that it is around 20 years that my love lasts. <laughs> with Roger, with Roger, I'm 78. Let's say that by 98, I am fed up. I might marry again. <laughs> <laughs> I get the feeling you are having an extremely enjoyable life. I do, that's true. <laughs> First of all, I have two dogs. And having two dogs is a great thing. Um, I put the dogs first and then Roger because Roger came later to my life, not because I love him less. Um, he's actually a very decent guy and he's very kind. Kindness goes a long way, especially at my age when, you know, I used to fantasize about Antonio Banderas, a night with Antonio Banderas. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, now I think it's too much work. <laughs> So, I, I, frankly, I'd rather spend the night with Roger. <laughs> or the dogs. 
Uh, with the dogs also, we are all in the same bed. <laughs> Do you regard ageing as a feminist issue? Of course. Of course. And that is something that feminism has neglected. Because uh, the, the women have forgotten that we age and now that we now we live 20 more 20 years more than our parents and women sometimes 30 years more because women live longer and usually in better health than men we are a tremendous force a resource that needs to be used for this cause you know women who are in their reproductive years have to take care of their children they have to work to support the family. And as soon as the children are gone, you have to take care of your parents. So there is a moment when your parents are gone, your children are independent and you are older and you have all the knowledge, the experience, you still are strong, you have good health, you are not demented yet. And most of the time you are single, by the way. Look at all we can do. I mean, it's, it's an incredible resource and I, count myself among those good old witches. <laughs> and I wish we would be all connected, doing good. That is more applause. Whenever you, if you'd like to ask some questions, this is a good opportunity. Um, so do please uh, put them into Slido and we'll, we'll put them to Isabel. There are a couple here in the meantime, um, which is one of, uh, from Emily. Does Isabel have a not so secret voodoo doll collection? I had, well, I do have a voodoo collection because I had a, a reader, a woman, who sent me voodoo dolls every year. Every year a new doll that would protect me and, and inspire me. So for, for many years she has not done it anymore, but I do, I still have the dolls. And apart from voodoo dolls, what, in, what inspires you still, Isabel? People, women. I, I, the women I meet through my foundation, women that, ha, that are very vulnerable, high risk, poor, that have gone through incredible trauma. They have lost everything. Some of them have lost their children. And still, they get back on their feet and they continue living. And some of them can even sing and dance. Those women are my heroes and they inspire me. I would say that that's the source of all the strong feminist characters in my books. I don't need to invent them. The strongest character probably in your books was the story of Paula, the, do the, the, the daughter you lost, the beautiful daughter. Um, there's a, a question here, if you're comfortable to answer, and if not, I understand. Um, how, how do you heal from losing your beloved Paula? Everybody mourns differently. Um, I think that the worst time was right after she died. Yeah, she, she was in a coma for a year and I took care of her at home. Um, and when she died, there was this void. There was nothing to do. And I couldn't, I couldn't remember exactly what had happened that year, it had been like one long night. The only thing that I could remember clearly was when I brought her from, in a coma from Madrid to California in a commercial United flight. This was before 9-11 when that was possible. Today it would be impossible. Paula entered the country without a visa, without documents. And she died in my arms on December 6, 1992. And I start all my books on January 8th. So when I, after she died, I, I just couldn't even speak. And my mother, who, was, who came, of course, when she was dying, my mother gave me back 180 letters that I had written to her during that year. And she said, after Paula died, read them. They are in chronological order. And you will see that there was no other way out for Paula but death. So I read the letters. And on January 8th, I started writing a book that 
is called Paula, a memoir. The, with the notes, <clears throat> with the notes I had started in the, in the hospital and my mother's letters. So my way of healing the first year was writing. That allowed me to see the year, at least in weeks, in months, I could separate things. And I could, I could narrate to myself what had happened. So that helped me. Mm -hmm. But I, when people ask me, how do you heal? How do you, people don't ask me, how do you heal? Usually they ask me, how do you get over? Something like that. You don't get over. And you don't want to get over. Why would you? You want to remember. Because the more you remember, the more you love. And, and the, the, the memory, the pain, is like under the skin. But it's a soft pain, pain a sweet pain. It's like, like tenderness. And it, it sometimes comes in a flash and just knocks me on my knees. But, but then I get up again and, and it's fine. Mm. I can live with the memory and the memory and the love and, and the foundation and all the things I do in her name. It's like living with her spirit. You've, you've talked about um, your early years. You've talked about Paula very movingly. You've talked about um, your husband's. Where do you find your strength from? Isabel, because you are clearly an extremely strong woman. And I think in lots of ways, that's what we feminists all want to tap into, is our own strength. Where does yours live? I, I think, well, first, I have very good health. And I have a purpose that, that keeps me going. I'm curious about the world. I'm engaged. But it's the connection to other women that makes me strong. I've always said that women alone are vulnerable. Women together are invincible. Men fear women together when we get together. So let's get together. <laughs> that makes me strong. I've got a question here, not with a name attached, but it's a good question. Do you think that the pandemic has taken women backwards or forwards? Because in some ways, men are more aware of how much we do, but women have also suffered very much financially. Women were the first ones to lose their jobs, will be the last ones to get them back. They have to deal with kids that are not going to school, often with abusive partners in the house with no, no help. Um, so women have really suffered more than men everywhere. There has been a real surge in uh, domestic violence also, everywhere. Um, but I think that when the pandemic is over and slowly but surely we get back to certain kind of normalcy, which I hope is different from the one we had before, women will, be, will have learned a lot also. And I don't think that we will be Take, we will be back in what we have achieved. Really? You believe that? That we will keep me moving forward? Yes, absolutely. Because uh, Not immediately. Yeah. Not immediately. But, but it, it will take time. But I think not only women are going to move forward, the world is going to move mm. forward. Because as I mentioned, there are things um, happening in Australia at the moment um, which are not useful to take you through individually, I don't think, at this moment. But we are very angry. There is, there's been a lot happening involving um, not just adult women, but, but children, school children. Children. A lot of us are very upset and very angry. And you said you grew up angry. In fact, you, you, your mother took you to um, a doctor because she thought there was something physically wrong. You had a worm or something. You were such an angry child. How do we, as strong women, frustrated at this moment by a system which is very difficult, how do we creatively and constructively, in your opinion, deal with anger? Anger is good. Anger is the fuel that moves us forward. Every revolution starts with anger at something that is unfair. And 
without the anger, nothing happens. So it's good that now in Australia and in many other places in the world, because it's not only happening in Australia, women are furious. And the more angry that we are, the more we can get done. But we have to channel it into action. In this moment, what needs to happen is that we have to make the world aware that there is an undeclared war against women. Women live in fear everywhere. We have it in our DNA. When we are little, we, are in, we get in our brains and in our bodies the idea that we are constantly threatened, that we have to take care of ourselves because something can happen. Be careful. Don't walk alone in the street. Be careful what you wear. No one go into a bar alone. You see a group of men cross the street. And that's in, in, in nice places. In other places, it's way, way worse. Mm. So that fear and that anger is what, what, has, uh, what ha has been the impulse for the women's movement. Now that we can create this global awareness of women in fear and women being victims of a war, we can do something. We can do much. But it's, it's, and as I said before, let's make young men our allies. They will be ruling the world with us in a few years. Not these old guys that need to die. <laughs> That's true. And do you, do you, like me, share great, great confidence in, in the young women also of the future? Because in lots of ways, the, the battles that we feminists of the, of the 60s, 70s, even the 80s fought, they're new battles now. Do you feel confident that the movement is in good hands? Well, those are the hands we have. There are no other hands. So we, I have to trust that they will do a great job. Uh, they will have to do what we didn't have time to do, what the mothers didn't have time to do. They, people say, well, well, you are passing your torch. Forget it. My torch is mine. I'm not going to pass it to anybody. <laughs> I will light other torches with mine, but I'm not letting go. <laughs> and I think that the, the young women today have their own torches and they will continue fighting, of course. Of course. We're not going back. How brightly does your own torch still burn, Isabel? It's smoky, a little smoky, but, <laughs> but it's still there. You know, it's like sex. People ask me all the time, can people at 78 have sex? Yeah, with some effort. <laughs> so the same with the torch. <laughs> it takes more effort than before. <laughs> It's been such a joy to speak with you. Um, do, are, there any, my, my are there any parting words you'd like to leave us with from where you are sitting? Uh, we're here in, in, as you know, in the Sydney Opera House where you've appeared yourself before. Um, any parting words? Thank you. Thank you to my readers in Australia. Thank you for, to every person that is in the audience and that they are listening. And to young women today, let me tell you, get together, talk to each other, change the narrative. It's in your hands. You can do it. You know, my agent told me when I wrote The House of the Spirits, you will have to do double the effort than any man to get half the recognition. But don't worry, you can do it. Isabel Allende, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was pretty amazing. Um, I'm sorry you couldn't. Um, we couldn't get through more questions, but it went down. But um, I think I think that was really a great pleasure and thank you so much for coming and, and joining, joining us here today. Thank you. Yeah.